Good. Uh, thank you, Peter, first of all, for inviting me, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'll talk also about RNAs a bit, so I've changed the title to a multi-omics approach to cardiovascular disease, so we're going to cover metabolites, proteins, and RNAs um, in the talk. So uh, you're all aware of the genetic sequencing efforts and that the human genome has been sequenced. We have many single nucleotide polymorphisms that have been linked to cardiovascular disease. But what we're often missing is the link between the genetic variation and the actual phenotype. And that link, of course, is mediated by the gene products. So what we are seeing is a shift from the genome to the actual proteome. And there are several layers of information that we try to integrate. And I always show these slides now to the students, which hopefully gets across the message. So the genome basically just tells you what might happen. If you look at the transcriptome, you see what is likely to happen. But if you look at the proteome, you see what is actually happening. And if you look at the metabolome, you see what has happened. So all these layers are important, but you just have to bear in mind that there's a different temporal sequence and a different confidence if you look at the protein level compared to the RNA level or the genetic level. And please also bear in mind that from the 20,000 genes that are known to encode for proteins in the human genome, we currently estimate that there may be uh, over a quarter of a million different proteins due to post-translational modifications, alternative splicing. So the complexity at the proteome level is far higher than at the genetic level. And the transcriptome is only poorly correlated to the actual protein level. So in yeast, the studies show about the 50% correlation between your RNA concentration and your actual protein level. So what that means, I think, for multifactorial disease in particular, that yes, we need the genetic information to determine genetic predisposition, but we also need to capture the interaction of the genome with the environment. And this cannot be done by genetics alone. We need additional layers of information, and these include the proteome, the metabolome, the lipidome, the transcriptome, and I think you'll also hear about the epigenome. So our aim is now to take these new technologies, and I think we live in a very exciting era where now we have large-scale omics profiling in uh, longitudinal cohorts, including, for example, the UK Biobank. Uh, but I think a unique kind of aspect in these studies is that you have sequential follow-ups. Every five years, you can get the same people giving you another sample. So you can actually determine the change of certain biomarkers with respect to the disease onset. And the study we are working with is the Brunig study. It's a town in northern Italy or southern Tyrol. Uh, and the unique aspect of that study is that you can see in this picture this nice village. Uh, nobody really wants to move away. So you can have a longitudinal study over 25 years of follow-up with 99% follow-up rate which is impossible in London, I can tell you, because half your population will be gone probably five years later. And what this allows us to build is what we call a person-based progression model of atherosclerosis. So we're not just looking at endpoints, whether you've got a heart attack or a stroke, but we actually monitor the progression of your lesions over 20 or 25 years. And therefore, you can see the early stages and the late stages of disease rather than just waiting for the endpoints, which of course you capture in addition. And one of the key uh, questions, of course, we like to address is how the kind of lipids which are circulating in the plasma ultimately end up in our arteries, and whether we have better tools to actually identify individuals who are at risk of developing the disease. And uh, this is a, s a short summary of a study we did a while ago. This was using mass spectrometry-based lipidomics. So there are hundreds of different lipid species. If we look at our current clinical assessment, then we pretty much focus on cholesterol, on high-density uh, lipoprotein-associated cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, the low-density lipoprotein-associated cholesterol. We also measure total triglycerides, but apart from this, we don't perform any other lipid measurements for cardiometabolic phenotyping. And, we, and really, these risk factors haven't changed over the last few decades. So the question is whether with the new tools and with the emerging technologies, there may be a benefit in starting to measure additional parameters. So in this study, what we did is, again, we measured in this Prunic cohort in approximately uh, 900 individuals uh, by lipidomics, uh, the mass spectrometry-based lipid profiles. And this is just the editorial from this, uh, from this study. 
And what was surprising to us is that a certain type of fatty acids, the saturated and monounsaturated fatty acids, which can be produced by the liver, were the lipid species that carried the highest cardiovascular risk. In contrast, the polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are exclusively taken up by the diet, were associated with a lower risk to develop events. And this has been seen in other studies. So this is a study, uh, I think, from a Spanish group. And again, it shows you nicely here how triglycerides, which we measure as one single entity in our clinical assays, can be split up according to the number of carbon atoms and the number of double bonds. And what you see here is that the saturated and the monounsaturated fatty acids indeed carry the high cardiovascular risk, whereas the polyunsaturated fatty acids are protective. So the take-home message is not all lipids may be equal. We know that for cholesterol, that's why we measure HDL cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Yet for triglycerides, we assume that all triglycerides carry the same cardiovascular risk, but this actually may not be the case. And so the take-home message here is that currently we just monitor lipid classes such as total cholesterol, total triglycerides. For cholesterol, we look at HDL and LDL cholesterol, but the focus is often on quantity rather than molecular composition. And I think we will see additional measurements for cardiometabolic profiling in the future. The problem, of course, is cost effectiveness, and it's going to be not affordable to measure hundreds of lipid species in a clinical setting. And therefore, the question is whether some of this information which you can capture at the metabolite level could actually also be captured at the protein level. And if you perform protein measurements in your lab, you usually rely on antibodies, so you pretty much trust your company to provide you with a reliable binder to your protein of interest. And many of these antibodies perform very well. Others, as you know, perform less reliably. Uh, the promise of mass spectrometry is that we do not rely on binders. We measure the proteins, the peptides, to be precise, directly. We measure multiple peptides from the same proteins. So we don't rely on the specificity of the binder. We measure the protein directly. So what does that mean for our cardiovascular risk profiling? So most studies to date, uh, in order to look at high-density and low-density lipoproteins, have focused on only two apolipoproteins. And this is ApoA1, which makes up 70% of the HDL proteome, and ApoB100, which is the only apolipoprotein present on LDL. There are many other apolipoproteins, but no single study has ever compared the different apolipoproteins with regards to cardiovascular risk. Why? In part, because for many of these apolipoproteins, there were no commercial assays, so people couldn't measure it. So with mass spectrometry, we can get, of, get rid of this constraint, and we can measure all the plasma proteins, uh, all the apolipoproteins in plasma. And this is due to the fact that apolipoproteins are relatively high abundant in plasma. So the human plasma proteome is the most complex proteome in the human body. The linear dynamic range of the high abundant proteins compared to the low abundant proteins spans 11 orders of magnitude. Right? So we are talking about picograms per milliliter at the low range, range and grams per milliliter at the high range. So this is a challenge for proteomics because we currently can resolve six to seven orders of magnitude. So without enrichment, we only cover the classical plasma proteins and some of the tissue leakage proteins. We cannot cover the interleukins and the cytokines. Having said that, with our latest uh, kind of workflows, we measure approximately three to 400 plasma proteins simultaneously. So what we did in this study, however, was uh, much less ambitious. We just focused on the apolipoproteins, and this is done uh, by the following workflow. So you take a minute amount of plasma, 10 microliter. If anybody of you has ever done an ELISA, then you know that you actually use 10 microliter to just measure one protein. If you use 10 microliter of plasma in proteomics, you can measure hundreds of proteins at the same time, so it's very uh, sample sparing. Uh, these plasma samples are digested on a robot by trypsin, so we turn proteins into peptides. And these peptides we call light peptides because they are not labeled. And then we add deuterated heavy reference peptides. So for each protein we are measuring, we have an authentic reference standard, so we can give you quantitative values. And the readout of the concentration is done by the mass spectrometer. So this is one of these boxes here. And in principle, what this mass spectrometry instrument does, it compares the spiked in re heavy reference standard against your light peptide in your sample. And this is done in a very high throughput manner. 
So we've seen uh, 10 to 15 minutes, one of these samples uh, can be analyzed for many apolipoproteins simultaneously. So what would we like to achieve? What we would like to achieve is shown here, and this is a hierarchical clustering analysis showing you the different apolipoproteins and the current clinical measurements uh, being lined up against each other. And rather than HDL cholesterol, which we currently measure in the clinic, we would like to measure all the apolipoproteins that associate with HDL because it's the protein composition that mediates HDL function. And rather than just measuring ApoB or estimate LDL, we would actually like to discriminate the LDL from the VLDL lipoproteins and get a more detailed cardiometabolic phenotyping in these individuals. And this was done in approximately 700 participants of the PRONEX study. And the summary here is shown on the following slide. So here we ask the question whether ApoB100 or ApoA1 are really the best predictors for cardiovascular disease. And here's our reference, ApoB100, of course, as expected, higher ApoB100 levels are associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So this is a hazard ratio for a one standard deviation higher concentration. So this gives you a 30% higher risk. But if you compare ApoB100 against the other apolipoproteins, you can actually see that ApoB100 wasn't the best predictor. And that three other apolipoproteins outperformed ApoB100 in this analysis. And this was ApoE, ApoC3, and ApoC2. So what does this tell us? That actually there may be cardiovascular risk beyond LDL cholesterol, because as I mentioned before, on LDL you've only got the single apolipoprotein, and this is ApoB100. And the apolipoproteins which we identified in this study are actually normally associated with very low-density lipoproteins. Very low-density lipoproteins also carry ApoB100, but they also carry ApoC2, ApoC3, and ApoE. So again, this was uh, our finding in a single study. Has that been replicated by others? And I would like to highlight this paper from a group in Oxford. And the first author is Michael Holmes. And they looked in the China Kadori Biobank, uh, again on lipoproteins, but this time by another technology. And they used NMR spectroscopy, nuclear magnetic <laughs> resonance spectroscopy. What this allows you to do is a very fast throughput analysis of your plasma lipoproteins. It doesn't give you the same detailed information like mass spectrometry in terms of apolipoprotein composition, but it gives you the different lipoprotein classes. And this will be now done in the UK Biobank in half a million people. So if we look for the associations of lipoproteins with incident cardiovascular disease, then this study actually pretty much replicates what we have seen in the Brunex study. Again, here are the different lipoproteins. Here is LDL. It's positively associated with your risk of myocardial infarction and ischemic stroke. There's a null association of LDL cholesterol with intracerebral hemorrhage. But again, I would like to point out that the risk, the cardiovascular risk, is not restricted to LDL. It's actually extending across all the ApoB uh, carrying lipoproteins that includes VLDL, IDL, and LDL. And of course, it's not just the cholesterol content of these particles, but as highlighted in green here, also the triglyceride content of these particles seem to be positively associated with cardiovascular risk. So to paraphrase Stephen Hawking, the cost of poor data is the illusion of knowledge. If we measure ApoB, we are not measuring LDL. If we are measuring ApoB, we measure all the ApoB-carrying lipoproteins. Similarly, if we measure ApoA1, we measure different HDL particles. Again, we lump them together. And as we know from the HDL cholesterol trials that have largely failed, HDL cholesterol may not be a good therapeutic target. So we really need to better understand HDL functionality. And in my opinion, this also means to better look at the protein composition of the HDL particles. So the take-home message for this talk is that cardiovascular risk is not confined to LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol is, of course, the major cardiovascular risk factor. But I think especially in the era of statins, we should also uh, think about the residual cardiovascular risk, and that may include other ApoB-containing lipoprotein particles. So how could these lipoprotein particles contribute to atherosclerosis? And this is this theory of remnant cholesterol. So LDL is very small, and it's, of course, cholesterol-rich, and it can cross from plasma into the arterial wall and be retained in the intima and contribute to cholesterol deposition within the artery. 
On the other hand, the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, such as chylomicrons, very low-density lipoproteins, are huge in comparison to LDL, and they were thought that they don't enter the arterial wall. But of course, these triglyceride-rich lipoproteins are subject to hydrolysis of the triglycerides by lipoprotein lipase. And when the triglycerides are hydrolyzed, these lipoprotein particles deflate and become smaller and they turn into so-called remnants. And these remnants still contain triglycerides, as seen here by this white uh, proportion of the circle, but they also contain cholesterol, and they are similar in size than LDL. And like LDL, these remnants of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins can also cross into the arterial wall. So the question is to what extent the cholesterol that is deposited in your artery is exclusively coming from LDL, or to what extent these triglyceride-rich lipoprotein remnants also contribute to the cholesterol buildup in the arterial wall. So that triglycerides um, may have been overlooked, and in part because they are negatively associated with HDL, and HDL is an excellent biomarker. Unfortunately, it turned out to be a poor treatment target. is also backed up by these genetic studies, uh, where they looked at loss of function mutations in apolipoprotein C3, and carriers of this loss of function mutation have a 44% reduction in their triglyceride levels. <coughs> Surprisingly, this reduction in triglyceride levels was also associated with a 40% reduction in coronary disease, really kind of reinforcing that message that, in, and at least under certain circumstances, triglycerides may carry a significant contribution towards cardiovascular risk in addition to the well-known risk factor of LDL cholesterol. So how are these triglyceride-rich lipoproteins cleared? And I think uh, I would like to illustrate this here briefly on this slide. So I mentioned already this enzyme. It's called lipoprotein lipase. It sits on the surface of endothelial cells. So this is how your plasma looked before you had your break. This is how it looks now after you've had your donut. Uh, but luckily, there is uh, a very potent enzyme, lipoprotein lipase, which is activated by apolipoprotein C2 and it's inhibited by apolipoprotein C3. So the lipoprotein particle already carries the activators and inhibitors of the enzyme that regulate its clearance. So if you have a loss of function mutation of the inhibitor, then minus minus becomes plus. So that means these people are protected because they clear the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins faster from their circulation. And it may not just be about your fastened lipid levels, because most of us live in the postprandial state nearly all the time, actually the risk of atherosclerosis may be more related to the postprandial lipid levels than to your fasting lipid levels. And I think there are studies ongoing who will look into this more detail whether this is actually the case. Anyway, so there's new uh, therapeutic targets emerging. One of them is now antisense therapy. Uh, this is a slide from Yonis Pharmaceuticals where they actually target apolipoprotein C3. They want to inhibit apolipoprotein C3 by giving an antisense. The antisense is well taken up in the liver. You block the synthesis of apolipoprotein C3, and therefore you get faster removal of triglycerides from the circulation. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is only possible for patients with very high triglyceride levels. But antisense therapy is currently also uh, developed, for example, for PCSK9. And I think it'll be interesting to see how antisense compares with our current antibody-based therapy to inhibit proteins. So the conclusion for this part of the talk is that triglyceride-rich lipoproteins may have been overlooked in part because of their inverse association with HDL. Uh, that now that we are in the statin era, LDL cholesterol is still the major risk factor, but we take care of your cholesterol levels. And the question is where the residual lipid risk comes from, and maybe in part that may come from the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. And as I've shown you here, APOC3, for example, is a therapeutic target in patients to manage very high triglyceride levels. And the final part of my talk, now that we have covered proteins, metabolites, uh, we would like to also look at RNAs and in particular on microRNAs, and I've seen some posters here, so many of you are familiar that we have small non-coding RNAs. In fact, there are more non-coding RNAs that are transcribed than coding RNAs. But in the circulation, uh, we find a distinct set of microRNAs. There are 2,000 microRNAs in the human genome, but only about 200 can be found in the circulation. And it's important to realize that most of these circulating microRNAs come from circulating cells, also, the first description in 2008 was in relation to cancer, 
but please bear in mind that circulating cells carry a lot of your circulating microRNAs. Liver microRNA 1 to 2 actually is the first microRNA that has received a letter of support from the FDA as a marker for liver injury in clinical trials, so that gives some hope that in addition to proteins and metabolites, we may also get RNAs as future biomarkers, at least in clinical research. And of course, uh, we are most interested in the heart, and cardiac injury, just like troponins, also releases a subset of cardiac microRNAs. And I would really like to take you through this timeline because I think this is actually quite fascinating. Uh, so the cardiac pro uh, troponins were first described by Professor Katos from Heidelberg in the late 1980s, and now it's clinically routine. It's the gold standard for determining cardiac ischemia. It's actually not even published in a very high-profile journal, and yet still it has changed medicine for the decades to come. Uh, so I think this is a good lesson to learn. Uh, and on the other hand, we then did a study where we compared the protein release from the isolated uh, Langendorf perfused hearts, and we were surprised to find this protein, cardiac myosin binding protein C. <laughs> so I told you before that plasma proteome is hugely complex. We have 11 orders of magnitude. We can only resolve six orders of magnitude. A simple way to overcome this limitation is that we take the heart out uh, of the plasma environment. We put it on a Langendorf perfusion system. We have a crystalloid buffer that's used as perfusion, so we remove the plasma protein background, and we can just look at the eloent that's coming off these perfused hearts. And here is the proteomic analysis and the summary, and you can see here cardiac myosin binding protein C was really off scale as one of the proteins that uh, was released most readily in response to cardiac ischemia. Now, Professor Mike Marber has then taken this assay forward and now really developed a very high sensitive assay for cardiac myosin binding protein C, and he wanted to see how cardiac myosin binding protein C compares against troponins. And these are the current guidelines from the ESC for suspected uh, non STEMI. And high sensitive troponin is an excellent biomarker, but it, of course, also results in a relatively large observation group. So you have patients that you can rule in, patients that you can rule out. But the problem group is the observation group because they need to stay in hospital because you cannot be sure whether they might not have cardiac ischemia. So this triage performance was then tested in the APACE cohort in nearly 2,000 uh, patients. And here you can see cardiac troponin T, cardiac troponin I, and cardiac myosin binding protein C. So these two are the gold standard. This is our novel biomarker. And pretty much for ruling, you can see that they perform very similarly. On the other hand, if you look at this observation cohort, you can see a difference. There's a large proportion of uh, patients that actually need to be observed because you cannot rule out myocardial ischemia at the time of admission. But if you actually look at cardiac myosin binding protein C, then the proportion of patients that are in this observation group is reduced. So this gives some hope that maybe in addition to troponins, there may be additional biomarkers that could help us uh, with earlier diagnosis. But of course, the field has moved on, and rather than just looking at cardiac proteins, pretty much since 2008, there was uh, a string of literature looking now at different RNA biomarkers. And the first RNA biomarkers were microRNAs, and for microRNAs, you have got uh, four microRNAs that are of interest. Two of them are relatively cardiac muscle and rich. This is microRNA 208 and microRNA 499. And two of them are also present in skeletal muscle, microRNA1 and microRNA133, but they're also released, of course, upon cardiac injury. Now, it didn't take long that after microRNAs, the first long non coding RNA was described as a biomarker for uh, cardiac disease. And uh, this is LIPCA. This was described by Thomas Tung's group, and it stands for Long Intergenic Non Coding RNA Predicting Cardiac Remodeling. It's a long non coding RNA that is uh, in the human mitochondrial genome, and the idea was that in part it may be released uh, in response to cardiac injury because, of course, the cardiac tissue is very rich in mitochondria. And the latest arrival in the RNA landscape are circular RNAs. And circular RNAs, if you haven't heard about them, they are generated by backsplicing. So these kind of circles have the advantage that unlike linear RNA, they are relatively resistant to degradation. And this, of course, would be a huge advantage if we think about biomarkers circulating in blood, 
that maybe the circular RNAs are even better detectable than the linear RNAs. And we wanted to put this uh, hypothesis to the test, so we pretty much have now the clash of the titans, proteins against RNA biomarkers, which biomarkers perform better in the context of cardiac ischemia. We had an extensive screening in human cardiac tissue. We ultimately chose the best 12 circular RNAs, the best 11 long non-coding RNAs, and 11 microRNAs. And we compared them against the gold standard troponins and our myosin binding protein C biomarkers in two cohorts. Uh, one is from patients undergoing transcoronary ablation of septal hypertrophy or TASH, and the other one from a study in Hamburg, uh, the biomarker in acute cardiac care study, where we particularly looked at patients that were admitted to hospital with low troponin levels initially, but then had a steep rise because they actually had myocardial ischemia. Now, one caveat in measuring RNAs is that all the patients that are undergoing coronary angiography will get the bolus of heparin. And most of you know that heparin inhibits the qPCR reaction because heparin is one of the most negatively charged molecules that we know. I think what people were less aware is that even a single bolus of heparin, given systemically, can really uh, alter your qPCR measurements of circulating microRNAs. So please be aware if you enter this research and you're working with plasma samples, and you have samples from patients undergoing PCI, you need to be taken into consideration that these patients had a heparin bolus and that without heparinase treatment, your crew PCR data will not be reliable. And this is just a summary of some of the papers that have been published over the years. And again, I think the big question mark here is that heparin and heparinase treatment wasn't really taken into consideration. Just to show you how pronounced that effect is, so these are uh, samples that were analyzed for a series of microRNAs. It doesn't matter what type of microRNAs, but one of them is present in a red <laughs> blood cell, the other one is present in the liver, and you pretty much see a dense correlation network. This dense correlation network has nothing to do with biology. This dense correlation network has to do with pharmacology because it depended when the patient received the heparin bolus and by what time you took the blood sample. If you afterwards treat the same sample with heparinase, then you start to see the more biological relevant correlations and you remove spurious correlations. So the red blood cell microRNA is of course not connected with your liver specific microRNA, but it would be connected if you don't treat your samples with heparinase. So please, uh, if you ever do this plasma analysis, uh, do this pretreatment, it'll give you better data. Okay, so back to our question. Um, what is uh, the best biomarker in response to cardiac injury? And of course, in patients with myocardial infarction, we do not know when the initial injury occurred usually. The advantage of this model of transcutaneous ablation of septal hypertrophy is that we induce myocardial infarction, so the time of onset of injury is exactly known. So here is the key summary. So the cardiac microRNAs, as expected, they rise after a touch. But then was the first surprise. The long non-coding RNAs, including LIPCA, show no change suggesting that these long non-coding RNAs in plasma are not derived from the cardiac tissue. And circ RNAs, also they were supposed to be very promising because they're circles, we really struggle to detect them very reliably. So also we have this new uh, RNA species, we still think that actually in our hands at least the microRNAs perform better than these other RNA candidates. Now, what is the potential advantage of RNAs? RNAs, microRNAs are cytosolic, so you could envisage that you need a less pronounced injury in order to release cytosolic components into the blood compared to myofilament proteins. And in part, you can see this. If you look in the first hour after induced injury, you can see that actually most microRNAs already peak, for example, microRNA1, and subsequently decline. And this is very different from the time course of troponin because troponin, of course, shows its peak level only 24 hours after injury. So indeed, there could be a different kinetics uh, that is involved in the release of cytosolic proteins compared to myofilament proteins. Now, this is the time course for cardiac myosin binding protein C that was uh, found by proteomics. And what you see here is, again, very nice that actually cardiac myosin binding protein C mimics some of the characteristics of microRNAs, that it shows a steeper rise, but also a decline at 24 hours when troponin is still rising. 
So in order to compare these uh, microRNAs against the proteins and the combinations, we performed some receiver operating characteristic analysis. And this is the analysis uh, for TASH. And you can see here that actually the best performing biomarker was indeed cardiac myosin binding protein C, uh, and it outperformed troponin and cardiac microRNAs in this analysis. So this is TASH, and you could ask the question, is cardiac myosin binding protein C a new troponin? But TASH is not myocardial ischemia. So we really needed to do the same test in patients who underwent or who had an acute myocardial infarction. And the advantage of the BAC cohort, which is relatively large, is that we could select MI patients that had initially low troponin levels and then a steep rise in troponin. And again, we ask this question, how does cardiac myosin binding protein C now in ischemia-induced injury compared to our gold standard cardiac troponin? And you see pretty much the same picture like you've seen in TASH, that yes, troponin rises very quickly, but actually cardiac myosin binding protein C uh, shows an even steeper rise than cardiac troponin, even after ischemia-induced uh, injury. What's a potential explanation? Why would one myofilament protein come out earlier than the other? Well, the answer is myosin binding protein C probably isn't coming out as an intact protein. Uh, the current thinking is that it's actually a cleavage product that's induced upon ischemia, and it's the release of these N-terminal fragments into blood that may occur slightly earlier than the release of troponins. But overall, I think myosin binding protein C performs very similar than troponin. So you can look here at the microRNAs and protein correlation. Here is cardiac troponin, which is, of course, used to adjudicate myocardial infarction. So it's nearly impossible to beat the biomarker that diagnoses the disease. Uh, but here you can see that the cardiac muscle microRNAs nicely correlate with the cardiac-specific protein biomarkers. On the other hand, the skeletal muscle microRNAs correlate with uh, creatine kinase. So how does uh, the receiver operating characteristic analysis look like for acute myocardial infarction? As I told you, cardiac troponin is used to adjudicate the diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction. So it's impossible or nearly impossible to beat. But having said that, actually the combination of troponin and cardiac myosin binding protein C in muscle enriched microRNAs showed uh, the highest uh, rock analysis uh, result. And that was very similar if we look for STEMI patients or for non-STEMI patients. So at least in principle, you could think of that the different kinetics of RNAs versus proteins may in future be an interesting opportunity to basically uh, look at the onset of myocardial ischemia. What are the problems? Well, there are many problems. One of the problems for muscle microRNAs and cardiac microRNAs is detectability. So muscle microRNAs, because they are not specific for the heart, are also detectable at baseline. So this, of course, has the advantage that upon cardiac injury, you can earlier detect the rise. That's actually one of the problems of cardiac microRNAs. Because they are undetectable and because the assays are not very sensitive, it takes quite a while for these uh, qPCR results to become positive after myocardial infarction. And I think this is my pretty much last slide, but I think it summarizes where the field is, and that means way, you know, far away from any clinical implication, because here you see a graph where we look at the microRNA concentrations in the blood, and we look at the troponin levels, and you can see that only if you have huge infarcts with troponins around 200 or 1,000 nanograms per milliliter then you get detectability of cardiac microRNAs in all your patients. And this is the same for microRNA 208, and it's the same for microRNA 499. So what that means is that the current technology is not able to compete with the sensitivity of the current technology we have to detect for proteins. So this is the last take-home message. So microRNAs in principle are promising biomarkers, but the assays lack sensitivity for early detection of myocardial ischemia. On the other hand, cardiac myosin binding protein C performs at least similar to troponin and in some cases may improve chest pain triage as an earlier rule out or rule in marker because it shows a different kinetics compared to troponins, maybe in part because it's a fragment rather than the intact protein. So with this I'd like to end. Uh, there are many people I need to thank, so this is my research group, but in particular our collaborators in Germany, Professor Christoph Liebetrau and Professor Stefan Blankenberg. Now Christian Schulte, who did the microRNA work that's just published, is here. He came with a DFG-funded fellowship. 
And we do have postdoc positions available. It's the last chance before Brexit, before you need a visa. So try to get in now. And I'd like to thank the British Heart Foundation for funding our research. And this is the equipment to do the proteomic measurements. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So you realize that Manuel's talk is not an hour and a half as it is, it is in the program. Yeah, that's why there were so many slides, you know, yeah. because I realized on the flight that I have 120 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so the uh, paper is open for questions. Still tired after the post lunch? Postprandial. Yes, postprandial, <laughs> yes, tiredness. Actually, so you say that we still have to stick with the old uh, troponins because I think that even if you combine these uh, very expensive measurements, you could, couldn't really raise the specificity. Well, you know, we know that troponin is an excellent biomarker, right? And it's one of the most successful biomarkers I think we have. Uh, so it'll be difficult to improve on it. Um, I think what, what, what is a problem and what we do know is that the kinetics of troponin of course, isn't very favorable in terms of that you need repeated measurements often in order to make sure that you have the rising troponin levels. And I think the fact that, you know, cytosolic proteins, protein fragments, and intact proteins may elude at different times, I think this, at least in principle, I think is an interesting concept. Whether it'll be sufficient to make a difference in the clinic, I think that time will tell. Micron is clearly, like you said, are expensive to measure, they are time consuming. But companies are working on this, and now companies, I think like BioVendor, develop already ELISA-based assays for certain microRNAs. So in future, we will not do qPCR to measure a microRNA. You will measure a microRNA maybe similar to like you measure now a protein. But at this point in time, you're right. I mean, these, me these measurements are simply for clinical research. Uh, and what I wanted to highlight here by showing this slide with the troponin levels is just how far the microRNA measurements are off in terms of sensitivity before they would make any impact. Having said that, the troponin measurements have had 10, 15 years of development, so I think we need to reconvene in 10 years, 15 years, and see whether there was any, <laughs> any progress on that front. So the students, maybe this uh, most active student price will be withdrawn from the market? Lucy so is very active. I am still a student. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much for, for this very nice talk, and I'm very happy that my many protein scenes also in the field it's of the most infarction. important protein. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, my question is more related to the N-terminal uh, peptide, which is cleaved. Do you have any idea which uh, enzyme is involved? Uh, no, but I think uh, you know Professor Mike Marber is looking into this. Because we have some data with scalpine. We, yeah. we did not publish for 10 years already that yeah. scalpine is weak and cut uh, myosin, cardiac myosin protein C. And is that ischemia induced? Or no, no, no. 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 We made, uh, this was experiment. Well, I don't know actually. This was done in yeah. vitro. Yeah. It's just that our capture and detection antibodies both work on the N terminus and then the assay works well. And I think if you use other antibodies, it doesn't work so well, suggesting so that is the N terminal fragments and the coverage on the mass spectrometer was all on the N terminus. Th that's actually very confusing. Well, again, I think it's a question you need to ask Professor Mike Marber because I think he thinks it's called Mike. <laughs> <laughs> because C, C yeah. oh my God, but it's C Mick, it's C Mick, and um, by yeah. mining by um, yeah, yeah, you're right. C yeah. protein yeah. C. Sorry, that M was my I mistake. Yeah, BBC. <laughs> Cardiac myosin binding proteins. No, Mick C. Mick C. I'm afraid it's uh, going to be published in circulation like that in so so research. Uh, it was already published in circulation. Like With this C. Mook? Sorry? With this C. Mook name? I think so, yeah. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to rename it, yeah. Yeah, it gets confusing. <laughs> I think this uh, most active student price will be converted to the most active faculty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Manuel, do you know if the microRNAs, are they free or are they bound to argonaut or something? And can you use that as a way of uh, purifying them and increasing the sensitivity? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the idea is that they're released in microparticles or microvesicles, like you know. Uh, we tried to, um, to just use larger volumes, and then you, of course, get better sensitivity. So rather than using 100 microliters, you can use 200 or half a milliliter. 
by isolating exosomes or microvesicles, the problem, as you know, is that I think there is no standardized way of isolating exosomes, and we get a lot of uh, additional variability. So the more processing you do, the more variability you introduce in your sample. So that's why I think for those type of clinical studies, we would like to use as little processing as possible and not go through the pain of isolating vesicles where we need a large volumes, maybe introducing variation. And then we still don't know what type of vesicles we have isolated. No, but uh, the microRNAs, if you spike them, they're rapidly degraded, so they must be compartmentalized because otherwise RNAs would clear them very quickly. And I think that's also the reason why, you know, certain microRNAs may be better detectable than others. It's not just about the concentration, it's about how they are compartmentalized in the circulation. And are there any news for the long-term prognosis, uh, prognostic value of some of these new biomarkers? Because you, has, you said only the acute phase of uh, infarction, but maybe the long-term prognosis uh, might be better for some of the new biomarkers. Yeah, I think the studies are ongoing, <coughs> but I don't have so no, the data no yet. news. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, last question. It has, it has become very evident that the need of uh, evaluating subtypes of HDL particles in order to better predict the risk. In your VLDL, did you, did you check for whether... My, um, no, no, in VLDL, did you check for whether the different size or whatever was correlated with high risk? Yeah, so, um, so this was done um, by NMR spectroscopy yeah, because you that's the, the beauty of NMR is you can get the different sizes of the lipoproteins. Uh, and it's a bit like we know that small LDL carries a higher risk than the larger LDL. Uh, for the VLDL as far as I see, I don't think there was so much of a difference for the size. Uh, but again, I think most of these measurements are formed, performed in fast and blood, right? So if you only do fast and blood, you'll only get a certain subset of lipoproteins. So I think it could be more interesting to look at the at the turnover of in the postprandial phase, how quickly your large VLDL particles are turned into smaller ones. And I think these dynamic measurements we don't have. Why don't we have them? Because most clinical studies are not performed on postprandial samples, uh, but actually on fast and plasma. Uh, so I think this, again, I think is an interesting concept in the future, what, what is actually mediating our cardiovascular risk. And of course, that would be exposure to lipids to the arterial wall but most of that exposure occurs in the postprandial phase that nowadays is pretty much constant, right? Because with every coffee break, we get another exposure to a lipid, uh, to lipid levels. So I think this is, this is, for me, I think it's an interesting question to look at the dynamics and at the functionality of the lipoproteins. Because I think HDL cholesterol just was a poor readout, as we now know, for HDL function. Uh, the other assays that are proposed for HDL function are just not implementable in the clinic, right? Like the cholesterol efflux assay is not something you could do in a clinical setting. So the question is, how do we capture HDL function? And uh, we think in part by looking at the proteome composition. Any of you work with proteomics in the audience? Yes, one. And any of you received some proteomic data that you had to integrate into your paper? Very few, yeah. So you all knew the limitations, yeah. What so limitations? last chance, yeah. What limitation? <laughs> <laughs> you told the limitations, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I yes. think it's not a limitation if you have a lot of data. It's just an intellectual challenge. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's nice. Thank you very much. So we have to move on. Yeah.